Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kata Beilin, Faculty Director of Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Center here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I have a great pleasure of welcoming uh, all of you uh, and uh, inviting you to listen to today's talk. Um, second talk in our special series this semester of visual approaches to the Hispanic world. And the talk is going to be given by Gabriela Yepes Russell um, and will be focused on uh, women in Peruvian cinema. But the more detailed introduction uh, will be given by our, um, my colleague and the director of Center for Visual Studies, um, Paula Hernandez. And just before I turn, um, turn it to Paula, I would like to mention that Paula herself has uh, been um, an eminent scholar in, um, in the study of uh, Hispanic theater. And she just published a book that I hope that she will maybe present for a lassie's so <laughs> next year or in fall semester, Staging Lives in Latin American theaters, Theater, Bodies, Object, and Archives by Northwest, uh, Northwestern University Press. So uh, as usual, uh, we will ask everyone to either type the questions in the chat or uh, to um, unmute themselves after the talk and just ask the question themselves. Uh, the talk will be moderated by Professor Hernandez. So without further ado, I pass her uh, the word. Paula. Thank you, Kata. Uh, and thank you for that reminder of my book. I, I need to answer that email, I, I, I will. Um, so today, um, I, it is my pleasure to be here and to see so many of you uh, sharing this moment um, to listen to Gabriela. Uh, Gabriela Jepe Rosel is a Peruvian theater and film writer, director, and researcher with a BA in communications and an MFA in radio, TV, and film from the University of Texas, Austin. Her scholar and creative work address issues like memory, gender, and history. Her short film, Dan Sac, To Live is a masterpiece and to give, to receive, and to return, have screened in festival film, in, fest, in film festivals in the US, Europe, and South America. Her play, The Therapist, won the 2017 Sala de Parto Playwright Award and the 2020 Luces Award for Best per Peruvian Playwright. It has been staged in Lima and Bogota and was part of the stage readings of the Out of the Wings Theater Festival in London. And I just wanna, just add a, a side comment that that's a pretty big deal in the theater world, so this is great. Gabriela is a first year PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Theater Studies Program here at UW-Madison, where she's researching Andean syncretic drama and performance from a gendered and decolonial perspective. In, 2000, in 2020, she won a film research award from the Peruvian Ministry of Culture to study women's film, film practice in the 20th century. And this is what we're gonna be hearing uh, today about her research. Her talk is titled Rebels and Braves, Gender Inequality in the History of Peruvian Film from 1899 to 1992. And just to remind what um, Kata said, please um, you know, use the chat or raise your hand uh, afterwards uh, so we can have a, a really um, productive conversation. So welcome Gavi uh, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Paola, for such a lovely introduction. Give me just one second. I'm just gonna share my screen with you guys. And I think you can see it. Is that all right? You can? Yes. Yeah, yeah it was Okay, good. wonderful. Thank you. So I'm just going to see me. Okay. So I'm here to present uh, Rebels and Braves is Gender Inequality in the History of Peruvian Film. And this research was born out of an interest of the cultural center of the Catholic University in Lima to honor the women of the Peruvian film industry in a digital exhibition that took place during the 2021 Lima Film Festival. Um, can you see the, okay, now you can, that's the next one, right? Okay, 
So when the center asked me to create this exhibition, I knew it was a unique opportunity for me to pay homage to the women that, women filmmakers that preceded me, but also to understand the historical origins of gender inequality in our cinema. And there's a recent study about the local film market that suggested that the percentage of women directors and screenwriters, which are two positions of power and recognition, was around 11%. And that number kind of matched the average of women working in films in the South American region. So I started this research in 2019. And at that time, gender inequality behind the camera was a topic that almost no Peruvian scholars had worked on. Much of the research was focused on the aesthetic and political analysis of films directed by women over the last 25 years. And there was almost no scholarship about the historical participation of women in roles like um, direction of photography or editing or sound or production design. On the other hand, the local film community didn't seem to know much about women who worked in films in the first six, six, six or seven decades of the 20th century. And because nobody knew who they might have been and nobody had studied them, it was assumed there had been no women <laughs> or that whatever they did was irrelevant. And this is a quote that I think summarizes this perception. It's, this is by a Peruvian film critic. His name is Isaac Leon and he said, confined for a very long time and almost exclusively to acting, female participation behind the camera remained practically unnoticed. It hasn't been hidden or silenced, just, just that simply put, women worked on roles that do not have resonance. Uh, so I decided to test the validity of these assessments. I wanted to identify women's participation over time. I wanted to assess the contribution, the real, con to, the real contribution to Peruvian cinema, but also I think I thought it was a great opportunity to understand the mechanisms, the social and cultural mechanisms that allow these women to access and work behind the cameras. So in other words, I wanted to study how gender, gender and gender, how gender operated and especially gender inequality operated in Peruvian film practice, particularly in Lima, which was at that point the epicenter of the center of film production. And also, of course, I needed to understand how that inequality changed over time. Uh, so I <laughs> set myself a very ambitious time frame. <laughs> it was almost like 95 years of history from 1899, which was the year the first film was shot in Peru until 1992, which is a very important year. And I will explain that why uh, later. Um, and I chose for this, because it was such a big time frame, I chose to follow the division suggested by Peruvian film historiography, because I think they indicate quite accurately a very specific moment in Peruvian film development. Uh, and thus, these are the, the first three de decades of silent cinema, and then four decades of talkies or sound films, and then 20 years when a cinema law was in force. The cinema law is called the 19327, and it was just 20 years. So that was, those were that was like pretty much my my time frame. But I also needed to create a framework with a strong focus on gender, and that meant, for instance, how would I use the category of women? You know, I didn't want to use it like to point out an essential quality of a perception perceived sexual condition, but rather a collective and political identity that is extremely diverse, extremely intersectional, that is always changing, that is in constant definition. And I also wanted to decenter the usual suspect of film studies, which is usually the director, as which is considered the main author of a film. Instead, I chose to examine the participation of all women working behind the camera, all of them, particularly those who work as what we call area heads or department heads. 
um, like directors of photography or production designers or makeup uh, artists. And that approach uh, allowed me not only to consider the collaborative nature of filmmaking, but also to highlight women working in those roles that are co called like low resonance, you know, like in wardrobe, uh, makeup, script, sound, etc. Um, and these positions have a very little symbolic capital because, because they are considered that they don't, they're not, they don't have enough importance to transcend time and be included in history. Or as feminist historian Michel Perrault says, in his story. <laughs> um, so I needed to find out how many women had worked in what movies, doing what. And who were they? So I needed a quantitative approach. So my assistant Elsa and I created a database with the crew information of nearly 1400 movies shot in Peru over 95 years. And you can see that database here. It's like, I don't know if you can see it, but it's like a lot of information there. And this database allowed us to really identify how many men and women worked in every film shoot uh, documentary, feature films, newsreels, et cetera, and then cross variables such as gender and film gender, film, film genre, gender and nationality, gender and expertise, et cetera. But it also led us to women that we had never heard of, and that was fantastic too. I also needed to identify, um, as I mentioned, these mechanisms that allow women to access the film industry or the film activity and the how it influenced the type of work they did. So I also uh, took a qualitative approach and I did almost like 30 semi-structure interviews with what I, what I found the most prolific department heads over 90, 90 years. And of course, some of them had already passed away. So I decided to interview their descendants. And I was pleasantly surprised to see how much of the life of these filmmakers was still present in the memory of the daughters or their nieces and even their granddaughters. And finally, yes, I approached the archive, but I didn't go to the official archive, which because of the pandemic was shut down anyways. Uh, and I, I wanna I remember, remember what John Scott says about like, if you wanna change the way you think about history, you need to find other types of evidence and look, in, look for in places that are usually overlooked. And I decided to access the filmmakers personal and family archive. And sure enough, there we found treasure. We found manuscripts, we found newspaper clippings, behind the scenes photographs, documentation, even script, script drafts like the ones you're seeing there, which is exactly that nobody had ever seen, had never been published, um, and these were the objects where the women actually left their marks. They left their traces of their work, which, and all of them had been discarded by the official archive and the official historiography. And this project, as I mentioned, was the basis of an exhibition of, at the Cultural Center of La Universidad Católica. So you can imagine the value <laughs> for, of these findings, you know? So part of what you're seeing in this presentation is, is are fragments of this unpublished and extraordinary archive we found. And after almost a year of research, we made some amazing discoveries. And I want to share some of those discoveries with you. First, yes, we managed to identify, identify women's participation over time. We found almost 2,000 people working in almost 1,400 films. And of those 2,000 people, more than 1,500 were men and 400 were women. So those who thought there were no women in Peruvian cinema were, I think, quite wrong. Uh, but <laughs> in order to assess the contribution of these women, uh, we needed to really take a closer look. So I'm gonna, these are the, the these are, this is a graph that shows like the participation of women in the first 30 years of silent movie making. So we found 50 men working behind the camera, around 50 men, but only four. So less than 7%. And we've traced information of three of them. 
And I'm gonna tell you very briefly about who are these three, three women. The first is Maria Isabel, was Maria Isabel Sanchez Concha. She came from an upper middle-class background, precocious reader, writer, poet, and she wrote the script of one short film. And after that experience, she got married, never worked in movies again. The second was uh, Stefania Socha, and she was a Polish actress that arrived in Peru in 1926. And in just four years, she founded a film production company, a film acting school, and direct a very su successful feature. And then she left Peru right before Second World War and never worked in movies again. And the third one was Angela Ramos. She was also a precocious writer, playwright, and she came from a working class background. She wrote the screenplay for a very successful silent comedy. And then uh, she never worked in movies again. She became a journalist, a very notorious journalist, but she never went back to, to movie making. Let's move like, <laughs> like ahead in time. And uh, that low participation continued over the next four decades of sound film. So between 1930 and 1972, we found 36, around 36 women working in almost 200 films, again, 7%. Of these 36, more than 20 were foreigners that came to Peru from Hollywood or France, shot one movie and left, and left, never came back. So I chose to find who were the women who actually had some work continuity and as who had like, um, worked as department heads, not just as assistants, but who had some responsibility on the shoots. So we managed to reconstruct, <laughs> I was hard to reconstruct the lives of only four women, like uh, who were department heads in more than one movie. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these four. And the first was Mocha Greña. Uh, she came from an upper class background. Her family was very involved in the arts. She was a very, a very successful fashion designer for the upper class and worked as a costume designer in many, many theater and film productions. The second was a filmmaker and painter from Argentina, middle class, and she produced the films of her husband, Oscar Cantor. Her name is Maria Esther Palant, I'm sorry. But she managed to direct her own projects and she, she had a career. She shot like, she pretty much directed 20 shorts about art in Peru. The third is Nora de Isque. She also came from an upper class background. She started working with uh, filmmaker Robert Godoy and then she went on to direct her own projects. And she actually became the first Peruvian woman to direct a feature film in 1982. And it had been 53 years after Stefania Socha, the Polish actress I told you about, had directed a film. And the fourth one was another Argentinian, um, who moved to Peru in the late 60s, Alicia Vasquez, and she had a very long career as production designer and producer for film and television. So for the first six decades, like only a handful of mostly upper class white limeñas or foreign born women were able to make films. And that for me was very revealing. But the most surprising I think discovery was how much this situation would change drastically. In the next 20 years, um, and this is like between 1972, 73, and 1992. And then we found 1,000 men working in movies and more than 370 women working. And of those 370, almost, no, at least 110 were department of four area heads in more than just one movie. And they came from all over, upper class background, middle class background, working class background, and many hadn't even been born in Lima. So my question was like, what happened? <laughs> uh, what happened? How did that came to be? So in order to explain this, we have to go back in time again. And I think this is more interesting stuff. Um, when cinema arrived in Peru, it came in 1897. And Lima was a very small, quiet city. Around 150,000 people lived there. And men and women lived under heavily marked, if you wish, gender mandate. 
And this was the masculine ideal. This image, for me, it's like a good summary. It's like the patriarch, the undisputed owner of the household, the natural inhabitant of the public space. He was able to vote. He could study high school and go to the university. Um, and the feminine ideal was its subordinate counterpart, good natured, obedient wife, the natural inhabitant of the domestic space. At that point in time, we're, we're thinking about the turn of the 20th century, feminine education was very limited to primary school and women learned only what they needed to do and know to become good wives and good wives and to a lesser extent, good mothers. They couldn't board, vote, they couldn't divorce their husbands, they couldn't even own or inherit property. Um, the presence, their presence in the public space was considered really a threat to the honor of the husbands or their fathers or their sons. And the absence, their absence in the home was seen as the end of society and the end of the family. And these gender mandates, I think also hit some hierarchies of ethnicity and class because European and upper class women were, were granted more liberty of action in the public sphere than indigenous working class women. However, and I think this is very interesting, as the 20th century progressed, these rigid, very rigid uh, mandates started to, to, to change, to suffer a lot of tensions. And the turn of the century also saw the appearance of the first public modern space in Lima, the first parks, the first boardwalks, shops, offices. And that meant for women, many working opportunities outside their homes for the very first time. Um, the first feminists of the 20th century began to advocate for women's right to education, work, to vote. And they very slowly, very slowly began to imagine a life beyond marriage and to a lesser extent, uh, motherhood. But also there's another process that is very important here, which is the migration, the migration from the rural areas to the cities, which I think is the most important social phenomenon in the history of Peru in the 20th century. And it slowly started to take place. By 1940, this quiet city was inhabited by half a million people. And 20 years later, that number increased to 2 million. This urban sprawl and several economic crises that took place opened the doors to secondary and university education for women. Um, the right to vote, to women's right to municipal vote was approved in 1933. And almost 20 years later, the presidential vote. Um, they could, they were allowed to work with the consent of their husbands or the ruling of a judge, as long as they did not endanger the family's reputation and honor. Um, but the social and public retaliation against uh, female professionals remain strong. Uh, even upper-class women, such as the one we see here, which is Nora de Isco, the first uh, uh, female director of feature films, faced a strong resistance when they got involved in cinema. Family rejection, social stigma, for some women meant divorce. Um, and this gender also inequality was very intersectional because again, um, foreign white, white filmmakers had experienced a very different socialization and their nationality and their ethnicity allowed them again, a more active presence in the public sphere than their local counterparts. This all changed like radically in the 60s and 70s, because I think this is the, these are the decades where things started to change at a faster pace, especially in the 70s. The internal migration kept transforming the country. By 1972, a quarter of the country's population lived in Lima, a quarter of the country's population. <laughs> and that number kept growing. Um, Around 1979, middle and upper class women started to gain access to contraceptive methods. That was very important. 
and divorce finally began to lose its uh, stigma. And the number of female students in universities just kept increasing, growing. And now there, was, there were more economic crises, so it was very difficult, if not impossible, to fulfill this ideal of a full-time housewife and mother. And women were forced to join, were forced to join the workforce, but the labor, uh, the labor remained extremely gendered. And they mostly were hired in professions considered like natural to the female sex, which are uh, jobs related to care, logistics, affections, and uh, which have less status and lower wages. Furthermore, women were expected to deal with a triple task of being a professional, wife, and mother. And so again, although they were allowed by the law, they could work if they didn't neglect their natural duties at home. And when feminists dare to protest about the situation, the press will call them resentful, ugly witches. By 1972, the government enacted law 19.327, and this was the first serious and systematic attempt to promote film production and secure distribution from the state. And this law was enacted, it had some problems, issues, but it worked. And in 20 years, more than 1,200 shorts and 80 feature films were released. And, jump, and women jumped from being 40 <laughs> in, 70, in 70 years to 400 in, in 20 years. And this access was now possible because number one, there was finally a small industry, but also, the sexual division of labor was like manifested itself very clearly. What was happening in the society manifested itself in, in, in film sets with women mostly working in, in positions associated with domestic labor, like production or assistant production, which is associated with the logistics of the household, working as scripts, which is also the logistics of helping the director, wardrobe, which is, which is associated with sewing clothes for the family and makeup associated to look beautiful. And you can see here, I don't know if it's maybe too, too, too little, but you can see this big chunk of blue <laughs> in the first row. That's like, like the most, uh, this is where like most women worked, which is production. Um, women hardly participated in roles such as cinematographer, news, news director, feature film director, lighting operator, which is are like the little chunks of blue at the bottom. They were and still are considered the most creative, most technical and most physical positions. And they are still mostly reserved to men. And on the bottom half, you see where women work and you see them working as produ producers, scripts, production assistants, et cetera, and makeup artists. Um, okay. And I want to point out here a very specific aspect. I don't know if, I don't think that happened in the US. Maybe it happened in other places in South America. I still have to find out. But in the 70s and 80s, we found many house, husband and wife production companies with wives producing their husband's films. They both worked extremely hard to make movies, but the labor, their labor provided them with very different symbolic capital. The public recognition was reserved mostly for the director, which was always the husband. It almost never worked the other way around. And this leads to us, this leads us to another problem, which is how traditional historiography tends to look at cinema when it only focuses on the husband director it tends to ignore the wife producer. And in the interviews I had with most of these producers, I realized their job wasn't limited to raise money or get shooting permits. They got involved in casting. They supervised uh, projects, general management. They were the emotional support of the cast and crew. They gave uh, creative feedback to the director at every stage of the production. And they had to deal with government officials and military officers to get permits, resources, money, authorizations. And they developed a high degree of resilience and a very strong sense of leadership. So I guess also that for some women, 
gender represented an advantage. They suffered less pressure to work in more like profitable prof professions than their brothers. For other women, filmmaking meant a great deal of conflict and rebellion against their parents. But for most of them, making movies meant freedom, living a very different life from that of their mothers and, god and grandmothers. Thanks to films, thanks to movies, they traveled, they made friends, they fell in love, they got to know different cultures, they were part of film shoots, they had these uh, fantastic families that you, you get when you are involved in a film shoot, they joined unions, they did political work, they even some of them gained social recognition, and a few even managed to postpone or reject marriage or motherhood. I think personally, that's my hypothesis that for all of them, cinema opened the door to the world. Okay, so there are many, I'm gonna be done in a few minutes. Um, there are so many, very, a lot of aspects that my research has not yet addressed, like participation of LGBTQ filmmakers and women working outside of Lima, women who emigrated to the US and Europe and then went back to Peru to make films. Well, the good news is that we got some funding to expand our database from 1993 to 2019, and we will include these categories in our future research. And also the cultural center of the Universidad Católica will turn this digital exhibition that you can see online into a live exhibition this upcoming August. So that's good news. Um, and this is to conclude, as I mentioned before, we found again, like 400 women working as department heads, area heads worked over 95 years. And 400 seems like a large number, but it's little less than a quarter of the total number of people who made movies on that same period. And I think this big gap helps us understand the gender inequality of the Peruvian film industry today and how it reflects and reproduces the gender inequality of Peruvian society as a whole. Um, well, I hope this project can contribute to question this sexual division of labor and women's still lower wages, and maybe help eradicate normalized uh, gender aggression and violence on sets. And um, well, in other words, to, I hope to change, we can help change the conditions in which women we are still make films today. And I want to invite you to the digital exhibition. It's there on the link from the image. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>